Let's get started. Okay, so today, well, we're going to start by reviewing what we did yesterday, but we actually are going to start um, the next mission of Pierre Atlas today. Um, and I'm thinking, I have to decide how far we get today about whether we, since we only have one day of EOF this week, maybe we'll do this on uh, Pierre Alves on Thursday also, uh, so that we can uh, finish off. Um, we have the, the next thing in EOF is uh, so far, which is um, the third friend. And then after that, then we go to the Satan and the Malachan. Okay, so I might want to say that for next week. What? He does, but the fourth friend doesn't talk until much, much later in the book. And so we're going to do the. Yeah, okay, hold on here. Yeah, yeah, he's been quiet until now. Okay, so uh, quick review of Avram Ben Ramam. Uh, we're just going to summarize it three bullet points each. Uh, hide, mm -hmm. floating, meaning controls. Yeah. So, what was the Derech Ha'am in your own words? Mitzvot. Mitzvot. Okay, good. So, that's uh, key, just basically a says and Losas is going to Halacha. And what was the Derech Ha'yachid? Finding like, the reasons? Yeah, oh, he, he okay. does it where like, he doesn't even put on his physical because like, he's very... You're physical. thinking about the specific example of Shabbos, which is true, oh. but the general thing of how do you do a mitzvah in terms of the derech yachid? Mm. And Leo started on the right foot. Oh, you do the minhag too. No, I have the minhag, the halacha. Halacha is part of the derech ha'am. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Can <laughs> <laughs> you be more specific than me? Like, what do you mean by meaning? Like, Purpose. Okay, good. Purpose. Yeah, Shirashim. That's ooh, that's a safer term. Yeah. Where, where did you learn that? Which class did you learn that from? I don't know. Yeah, because that, that's like a that's like a very yeah. I was gonna say that's a very specific term for for reasons for the mitzvah. So it's keeping the mitzvahs with the aim of achieving their objectives. So you figure out what is this mitzvah trying to accomplish? Like, how is it supposed to be perfecting me? Um, uh, which I don't know if you guys remember this from Gemara. Mitzvahs perfect you in three ways. Oh. Oh, your mind. Your mind. Yeah, your, mind your social interactions. Your social interactions. Whoa, wait, wait. Your character traits. And your character traits. Yeah, yeah. we're doing the opposite. It's like in the parentheses on your shoulder. Yeah. I see yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, right. Right, so what you do is for every... And it could be... Uh, mitzvah could have multiple purposes, you know. But what you do is you take the mitzvah and figure out, okay, what is this mitzvah trying to do? Is it trying to give me a true idea or move a false idea? Is it trying to give me a good meter or move a bad meter? Is it trying to like do something, accomplish something good in society or, or, or remove something bad? And then you keep the mitzvah, you, uh, you keep all the halachos, but you keep it in a way that tries to achieve those results, okay, to the extent possible, all right? Why is the derech am called the way of the people? Same for everybody, right? And so the example, I, one of the examples I gave is, is when I sit in the sukkah, in Der Ha'am, that's exactly the same as Yeshua bin Nun. He's a great tzaddik, and I'm not, but our action of sitting in the sukkah is exactly the same. But Der Ha'yachid, why is it called Der Ha'yachid, or how does the Der Ha'yachid differ from the Der Ha'am in terms of like who it's for? Up there, people, right? So Yachid is like a, a high individual. Um, and I, uh, I decided to bring out a slightly different point here also is, I think it's also good to call it derech yachid, even if you don't want to say it's like a, a really good person, because it differs from person to person. It's individualized. Halacha is not individualized. Everyone has to keep the same halacha, unless you have like an exemption, you know. But derech yachid, you tailor the halacha according to your, oh, sorry, you, not the tailor the halacha, you tailor how far you go based on your own understanding of the mitzvah and where you're at. Okay. Last point. What was my last point here? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, What's the only way that you could say there are different levels within the derech ha'am? Quantity. Okay, good, right? Is that there's no levels except for how often you do averos and like how severe the averos are in terms of like, is it intentional, unintentional, rebellious? Okay, accidental. Derech ha'yachid, how would you describe the differences in levels? Quality, good. Okay, exactly, right? So there's lots of different levels and uh, different qualities there, okay. So we kind of interrupted because of the whole fiasco yesterday and the water and stuff. I'm going to make sure my bag is over here and not spilling anything. Um, what's the, uh, um, so I forgot to song. I feel like you were in the middle of asking a question, but I don't remember. I mean, I'm just understanding that. that. Yeah. So let me, let me tell you where uh, a good example of this, that I think you can relate to. Okay. So this came up in a faculty meeting in, uh, in shall have it. Um, in, I, I want to say, <laughs> I want to say, yeah, now I can tell you without like feeling like I'm compromising anything. Uh, I, I feel like this was in 2012 or 2013. So it was like, it was fairly early on, you know, and we were revising, this is the beginning of the year faculty meeting, and we were revising the, um, the student handbook, okay? Um, 
Uh, and this happens like uh, every year. I think I think they switched it to doing it at the end of the year instead of at the beginning. But this time we're doing it at the beginning of the year. And the question was um, uh, dying of hair. Okay. So what was the policy? I don't see, I don't really know the handbook. What was the policy? Yeah. So this is when that that was decided. Okay. So what so what happened? Someone. Oh yeah. The question was: Should we allow? girls to dye their hair unnatural colors, right? So I think the example was like pink hair, you know? Okay. And I think what had happened was that the year before that, a student had dyed, uh, had uh, done like pink tips or something like that. Is that what you call it? Like just the ends of your hair? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so th it was back and forth discussion. And then one teacher said it should be uh, prohibited in the, in the school dress code because it's not sneeze, okay? So that riled me up. I was kind of like not not um, not talking uh, in the meeting so much because like I, I, dress code is not really my area, and you know. But I said I said um, uh, like oh, actually let's see let's see if you can guess what I said based on this distinction. That's not okay. You know, put it in these categories here. Oh, that's not ah okay good exactly. In other words, like this is you could make the argument depending on how you define seniors. That's a whole discussion. You could make the argument that that on a person's der hayachid, that that dyeing their hair an attention grabbing color or whatever would not be tsunua. But that's not a halacha. There's no halacha that I'm aware of, even according to like the people who hold like who who like don't dye their hair. Never heard anyone say it's against the halachos that have to do with like like a halachic aspects of tsunus to dye your hair uh, a natural color. Never heard of such a thing, right? So my argument was, if you want to say that you're going to make it usher in, in the handbook, I shouldn't say usher. If you're going to make it restricted in the handbook, because we don't, we want a certain image for our school, or like, like we don't want, like you know, what? If you're going to make a non halakhic argument, that's fine. Don't tell the girls that you're prohibiting it because it's not snua. Because what that does is it crosses the lines between the derech ha'am and the derech ha'yachid. Like, if there are, uh, give me, an, I'm sure you have examples of like friends who are in like really strict schools where they, uh, like give me an example of something that is like um, a very strict dress code thing. You that, have to wear socks, you have to it. Okay, no, but give me, a, give me an example that is like not within the realm of the halachos of Nail polish. Nail polish, okay, it's nail polish is thing, right? I heard somewhere else that there's like, uh, Hair length thing is that a thing? Yeah, that's yeah. So what what is the what is the 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 standard that they have? have it too long. Too long. Yeah, exactly. Right. So what what happens is I think I, I've never like interviewed people who have gone to schools like that. My guess is if you are raised from a very young age where your school has like equal rules about skirt length and hair length and nail polish, right? In your mind as a kid, if you don't learn learn the halachos, you're going to think that things are actually against halakha when they're part of the derech hayachid, you know? And that, I think, is one of the biggest problems of, uh, causes of problems in Judaism, in Jewish uh, society today, is people mixing up the derech am and the derech hayachid and imposing things on the am that are really part of the derech hayachid, you know? I could feel how it could be beneficial for the community, especially because like, students need to help prevent Right. It, I'm not arguing that it's beneficial. What am I arguing? that you shouldn't present it as halacha, okay? That there's a difference between halacha and astringency, you, you know? If you present it as astringency, people like seeing it. But if you present it as this is how we follow halacha, then they'll feel more inclined to it. I think that's a dangerous gambit. And what's the first, uh, I mean, this is a famous thing. We, I feel like we talked about this in last year. What's the famous first case of someone doing that and ending up it being ending up really bad? Of someone like treating astringency like it was uh, halacha? Oh, Adam and Chava, right? Oh, well, what's the uh, the midrash? Right. Yeah, right. Is uh, is God said don't eat it or else you die, and then he said don't uh, touch it or else you'll you'll die, and uh, and and because it was unclear what was the chumrah and what was the actual halacha, then people got you know then 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 it left room for that like uh, uh, misunderstanding. And, oh well, if I touched it and I didn't die, then if I eat it, then I'm not going to die. And that's why if when the rabbanan make a halacha midr rabbanan. They have to make it clear that it's their abundant and not their risa. Otherwise, they'd be in violation of what? Oh, um, low Bal, yeah, like low tosif allowed. We were talking about this with my aunt. Yeah. And like, she was saying that like, the more strict communities, 
do this a lot and modern orthodox girls like they make a clear distinction yeah like mainly in terms of skin um and Wait, what, what did you just say? What? Um, right, okay. Yeah. She said that the some say that like the rabbis have to be sure that it's not not adding, but not they don't have to make it clear to the entire community as long as they know. Right. Uh, it's, 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 that that might be that might be an opinion. Uh, yeah. but so uh, it's not black. okay, sure. So I, I that, that could be opinion. I've, I've never. Um, I'm trying to think if I've seen anything. Yeah, I, I guess I've, I'm familiar with, with the other opinion. I've never seen the other one, but but uh, even if that's correct, then I, I still think that it is to the advantage of the Jewish communities as a whole to know it, even if it's not halakhically like mandated for baltosive reasons. Um, yeah, and now you can you're, you're arguing that people are going to treat it in a lesser fashion if it is uh, if if they. If it's taught as a uh, yeah as as a chumra right uh, instead of uh, as part of the halacha was that your right, argument right, yeah. yeah yeah right so uh, I, I hear that I guess the question is at what cost in other words yeah. like is it a greater cost to have people um, like knowing what place this has in the halachic system and then treating it more leniently because it, they know that it's a, a stringency or is it a greater cost? To uh, not know what it's like in the halakhic system, and then, and then you know, have the effects of that on the community. Because what, what is happening, like what happens from the fact that they call it uh, the slang term is chumra creep, which means that in each generation or in each community, the chumras keep on getting layered on more and more and more because people religiously want to be stricter. You know, so like it ends up being very overwhelming. And then what what are some negative effects of that? Like for the people who want to be mafia, great. They love it. Yeah, it's hard to live up to those ideals. And then what ends up happening in terms of their practice, they won't do the real thing because they'll say, like, I can't keep all of these laws. Mm -hmm. And then they'll give up on the entire thing. So it's almost like the same consequence that you were saying to be worried about. But it like reaches instead of happening on the individual basis, it, it happens like on a breaking point where like a person is just is overwhelmed by all. Let's say Pesach is a good example of this, right? Mm -hmm. That people have a lot of humors around, uh, around comments on Pesach. You know, and you can argue that each humor is added for a good reason, but there are certain people who feel so overwhelmed by all of the humras on Pesach and don't know what is like an essential halakha and what's actually a humra that they just, they give up on the whole thing, you know, uh, or they, they selectively give up on certain things. And because they don't know the difference, then they end up violating something that's actually like severely usher, you know, um, instead of that, or, or Shabbos is another example. Kashrus is another example. You know, I'm sure sure in, in East Arabia, it's another example, you know? Um, so, so that, that's my, again, I'm, I'm not a, uh, this is not a philosophical opinion. This is like a sociological opinion. I think that this is one of the greatest problems in terms of the way that the Jewish community relates to halacha, of the leaders not making it clear what is der ha'am and what is der ha'yachid. And if they made it clear, so then what you could do is you on an individual level take on different aspects of the der ha'yachid based on what is what you you can handle, based on your life circumstances, you know, and 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 uh, and everyone keeps the der ha'am in a more uniform way. That was my little, yeah. yeah. Year old, if you don't give them, if someone like can't make the choice, yeah, it's better not to do it. Like, if the community as a whole, obviously, there are some people who would like who would benefit from hearing every single stringency and what is actual halacha, and then they can make the choice on their own. But I think majority of people aren't going to be able to like make the choice of like once I hear that these are the stringencies, they're not going to be able to like think about it. The right way. See, I, I, so I think uh, this, I'm not saying that you're wrong, but I think that you're uh, not looking at one thing, which is I think you're imagining what would happen if now we changed to the model that I'm suggesting, um, and and I, I'm saying I, I acknowledge that that's a problem. I don't know how we get from point A to point B, but imagine a world in which this was the norm. You know, where like the baseline was when you start keeping halacha, let's say like bar bat mitzvah, you know, or before bar bat mitzvah when parents are training the kids, they they just do chinuch in terms of the actual halacha. And it's a it's a thing, like it becomes like a, a value in the society where 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 like that's what parents do. And then as the kid learns, they like they're given the trust and the responsibility to take on additional chumras as they see fit. 
you know, I think that if you start off with that as the baseline, it's, it ends up being a different mentality. Right. You have to just change like the whole and yeah, how and that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. I, I I have no clue whether it's possible to get back. Like, it could be that, that the toothpaste is out of the tube already, as they say. Yeah. You know. So I guess when I, let me clarify what I mean by chumra. There's chumras within halacha, and then there's chumras that are in the derech hayachid. You know, and sometimes it meets both qualities, right? Let's say, for example, in did you learn uh, the halachas of hair covering with Mrs. Uh, H. Fader? Yeah. Yeah, right? So, like, what's the what's the the essential halacha of a woman covering her hair in her own house when she's by herself? She doesn't have to, right? And do you remember, I'm sure you learned the Rabbi Huda Nasi's wife? Yeah. Something like that, right? So I, th I think the, the expression I remember, I forgot what it says in the Gemara, is the walls of her house didn't see her hair? Right. Yeah, right, right. So, like, like that's something where it you can argue that it's uh, it's both. You know that that's in within the halachas of uh, of Tineus, but it's also going beyond the letter of the law for like you know to try to embody the value more. You know, that's like both. An example of something that's purely a halachic uh, humra would be like in um, like uh, this is a, 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 a funny example, right? But in um, when I was in yeshiva, I don't know if if, if everyone does this still. <laughs> then. Then uh, I don't know if this came from the Soloveitchiks that she uh, had the men have to be machmir to do the Nianui Halulav in all of the different shitos. Uh -huh. So like Ashkenazim just go like one way, like don't go there. And then in Yeshiva, I, 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 I changed, I did Hataras and Darim a while ago, but I think it was like, and then you got to squeeze it into Hallel, you know, like doing like, a, so that, exactly. So that would be a purely halachic chumrah. You're, you're not achieving the purpose of lulaf better by doing that, right? And then there are things that are, are purely derech yachid chumras, like kashra's example that we gave yesterday, where instead of just keeping kosher, you also eat healthy. Right, mm -hmm. so eating healthy is not does that just doesn't register in halacha at all. There's no like chumra of like you know you should eat healthy in terms of kashrus. So that's purely derech yachid, you know. So what I'm saying about the the chumras is I'm saying everyone should know like what what the baseline halacha is in general, mm -hmm. um, and but and, and I think you can make an argument that things that are halachic chumras should be standardized by the community because that's how minhagim work. Oh, those, those yeah, let's say for example like you know you have the shita of what's the most lenient shita of um, how long you have to wait after eating meat before you eat milk? Yeah. One hour. Wait, and the one, one hour, that's one hour is the most lenient one. And that's actually a variant on an even more lenient one. Bench. You bench and then you can have, you know, right? So like if a community, I'm not saying that that we should go to ground zero for all um, minhagim and all, everyone take the most lenient minhagim. For halachic areas, then within halachic humras, I think that has to go on a community by community basis. I'm arguing purely for the, Pushing the derech hayachid standards onto people uh, beyond halacha, uh, that I'm saying should should be left up to the individual, and and we should have a culture that has that. How we get to that culture? Is it possible to do that? Like you know, I, I have no idea. You know. Do you think that by placing derech um, and derech hayachid together, it like caused the separation of like the sects of Judaism, like Orthodox, conservative, reform? It's a good question. Um, I, I can't say it caused that because um, there were a lot of factors that caused it. Did it contribute to the divide? Probably. Like, in other words, the first Reformed Jews, when they were rebelling against halacha and viewed halacha as like this, like stifling, you know, thing, I, I got to imagine that for at least a percentage of them, then they might not have had that strong of a feeling if halacha had been kept in a in a derecha, purely derecha am way. Like, I'll give you an example. Like, in Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, at the end of his speech in Devarim, he says um, uh, that Torah is very close to you and easy to do, basically. You know, like, like it's, it's um, uh, you know, now you ask any Jew, is Torah, is halacha easy to keep? No, of course not, you know. But if you just looked at the Doraisas and the Durabanans, it actually is very manageable. The, what's the problem though is that the halacha we keep is basically you have the derisons and the derabans and then you have every mach locus mm -hmm. and we are machmir to to fulfill multiple opinions in each mach locus and then you have mach locus in the next generation on how to interpret that homer and then you just add right. tons and tons of mach locus where over you have like a generational homer creep you know over the course of like centuries you know so i think we're in a point right now again i don't think there's anything we can do about it without a sanhedrin you know sanhedrin i think can clean house a little bit like I know, 
you know, like standardizing halacha, making one thing and like resolving all these machlokas so we didn't have to like just do the chumras, you know. Uh, but I think like practically there's nothing we could really do right now about that. Um, so answering your question, uh, I don't know how much it played a role in that division. Um, it is interesting that in the Sephardic world, the divisions between Ash uh, between um, Orthodox Reform and Conservative are not nearly as sharp as in Ashkenaz. It's like everyone realizes that like Orthodox halakha is correct. And you have people who like keep it and people who don't keep it, but like they'll go to Orthodox shul and, you know, yeah. So a lot, lot of societal factors there also. Yeah. Okay. So this is a distinction that I think is good to have in mind. And just to remind you, there's a point I forgot to put up here. Um, derech, someone who keeps the derech am, what, what do you say is the best term to describe them? Sadik, because sadik means what? Right. Righteous, right? So you're doing the right thing. And then for derech hayachid, he said the best term is chasid, because chasid means yeah, uh, yeah. He didn't say kindness, so he has voluntariness, right? Is you're doing something on a voluntary basis. You're going beyond the the obligation, you know. So I think when we learn Pirkei Avos, it helps to keep this in mind. Which Mishnayos and Pirkei Avos are talking about the Derech Ha'am, and which ones are talking about the Derech Ha'yachid, and we can expect. What would we expect based on what we've learned about the purpose of Pirkei Avos? You would expect it to be all or mostly Derech Ha'yachid because we're dealing with people who are trying to be Hasidim, right? So like you know. And it's not, uh, yeah, it's not halachi, right? This is the ethical mishnayos, right? Yeah, I, I just think that the, 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 there are going to be statements in Pirkei Avos that do have to do with things that are in the halachic realm, you know, uh, just not a lot of them. For example, there are halacha, there are things about, you know, um, uh, like certain things about tzedakah or about uh, being a judge and stuff like that 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 um, that might just pertain about like how to keep the judge halachos in a proper way. Uh, not extending them beyond their. Uh, yeah, but some of them are, are precautionary, like like be careful not to violate the halacha by doing this, you know, and that would be more of a derech on thing. But the majority of them are going to be derech yachid, I think. Yeah. Okay. Ready? Any, any questions on this? Or okay, let's start our analysis of the new Mishnah. Um, uh, Ayala and Elisheva, I forgot to send this to you. Um, so. I'll put it on the screen, but I forgot to send it to you, and it's too complicated for me to send it right now. Um, okay, famous one. Is there a song for this? Probably. Probably. This is definitely one they make a song out of. No, no, no really. I don't have a song for this. One. There's one about you're going to the grave to rot, but there's not one about this. <laughs> uh, you sent it? Oh, I missed it. I missed it. I gotta, go, I gotta go back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would love to check it out. Yeah. Um, okay, so who would like to read this very, very bare bones? I feel like there's a certain like economy of letter usage in this. All very short, basic words, yeah, you know? Like yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, very, very uh, non, non, like you wouldn't naturally say this. Okay, who wants to read? Translate. Go ahead, Ayala. <laughs> No, oh, sorry, I didn't see. Did we? No, oh, okay. Not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Hill Woodson. Yeah, good. Yeah, you used to say good. Uh, and, and by the way, the only reason this is in the brackets is the previous two Mishnayos are also Hillel. So the, uh, in Mishnah 12, it says, uh, Hill and Shammai received Torah well from them. Hillel used to say, and so it mentions him by name. I just put Hillel in here so you know who's saying it. Okay, so the actual Mishnah says, Huhaya Omer. So I'm just filling in the pronoun. Okay, go ahead. Okay, that, that's a good straight translation, good literal translation. Yeah, so um, so who is for me? So the, the most common way I've seen this translated, and again, you know, the Machlok is here. If I am not for myself, Mili, who is for me? Yeah. Yeah, oops, not, not a hat. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll change that in a second. Yeah, exactly. Okay, good. Uh, let me just change that there. Uh, and oh, what? What's that? What's that? Oh, I thought it said when I am by myself. Oh, <laughs> no. Um, uh, okay, hold on. Let me just uh, go back here again. Oh, you know what? I don't need to do this. Hold on. We, we, we're going to need to type, so I should keep this here. Okay, so simple to read, but not so simple to analyze. So what are the questions here? What is the 
Yeah. Yeah. What is what wait? What is he even talking about? Right? Like, what is this even in regards to? Like, like it's very like existential. Like, yeah. if I am not from you know, like it's almost like a to be or not to be type yeah. question where if you didn't know the context, you'd be like, what do you mean, man? Yeah. What else? What, like, what is each question asking? Yeah. An answer. Yeah, okay, good. So, each question separately? yeah, what uh, I'm just gonna say, what is uh, each question asking? Um, and uh, yeah, what is each question asking? And do you say, what is the answer? Um, right, I just didn't hear what you said. Like, what's the each half of the question? Yeah, I mean, because these seem like rhetorical questions, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah right, okay, good. Uh, what is each uh, question asking? Uh, you know, I'm going to add another term here, uh, and I don't remember if you, I don't know if you do, do this in, in Rapesach's uh, Rep um, Marsh here. Do you know what the term Hava Amina means? Yeah, yeah we did it with you also. You did it with me, but not everyone was in my Gemara class. Um, um, so what is a Hava Amina? What would I have thought? You're thinking of Nafkamina, right? So what would I have thought? Okay, so what, I'm going to say this. Well, this will be clear when we start analyzing it here, okay? What... Oops, sorry. What is the Hava Amina for each question? Meaning, what? Uh, why is it necessary to even ask this? What would we have thought if Hillel? I'm just elaborating on this question. Hillel didn't uh, didn't uh, raise the question. In other words, let's say, for example, um, uh, if I'm not for myself, who is for me? So, would you have thought that someone was for you? You know, like, like, well, what exactly, whenever you have a question, there's at least like two answers, right? So like what, you know, if he, if he has a certain answer, so then why would we have thought the other way? Because if there's only one answer, then you don't need to ask the question at all. You see what I'm saying? I know. Like if I say, for example, um, if I say what's for dinner tonight? So there's at least two possibilities. If you're in prison and you're getting the same food every day, then you don't ask what's for dinner tonight, you know? True. Yeah. So like what 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 might you have thought if Hilla didn't come along and get you to ask this question? Yeah. Also the Yeah, Ella. The at the end, like it says, and if not now, when I feel like that's its own topic. Like what's that talking about? Okay, good. So let's actually just broaden that into a question, which is a bigger question. What is the relationship between the three questions? Okay. And I think you're right is that the third one seems to be the most different because the second one explicitly connects it to the first one, right? If I'm not for myself, who is for me? And when I am for myself, what am I? So being for yourself or not for yourself is what the first two are dealing with. And if not now, when? It's not about like being for yourself or not being for yourself. Is there like a specific, this is the question. Yeah. Is there a specific or some, or some, so you're asking like what's the uh, what's the practical the practical uh, application slash relevance expression? Like, yeah, what is this relevant? To okay, you? what is the practical uh, relevance of this? Let's say relevance or implication. Yeah. Right. So Ayala's first question was, "What is the subject? Like, what's the context?" This is. This last question is okay. So, what am I supposed to do with this information now that we now that we know the idea? Okay, I think that covers it in a general way. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, let's let's make that a separate question, like we used to do for Mishlei. Who is the audience of this uh, Mishnah? I almost said puzzled because I'm used to Mishlei. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's funny. <laughs> um, yeah. Break the glass ceiling of Chasidus. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was going to say one more thing. Oh, yeah. Another thing also, which I'm very, I, I'm, I'm happy you translated this. In all the years I've learned and taught this, I always, in my mind, translate it as if I am not for myself, who is for me, and if I am for myself. But you correctly translate it as when I am for myself. So I don't know if that's significant, like the if and when. If sounds like I could be or not be, I could not be. When sounds like I'm definitely going to do it. It's just a matter of time, you know. And last one's also if. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just add that just in case we, we answer. Okay. So what, uh, why does it say im for the first and third clauses, but kishe 
for the second clause. I thought you were you were just pronouncing <laughs> second clause. Okay, now this is the type of thing that like you know sometimes. Oh, let me go back here. Hold on. Sometimes um, I feel like we could work on this on our own and like try to get stuff. I feel like if you think if you want, we could try that. I feel like this is just really hard to. Uh, I know. I'm like writing out the conditions. <laughs> yeah, it's just like really like I, I uh, when I Mike Rose and I did this, like we didn't get very far when we worked on this on our own without the Mafarshan. So should we, should we try to do it without the Mafarshan first? Do you have any ideas? <laughs> like, what does it even mean to be for yourself? And like, I feel like it would just include. It would need a lot of like insertion of random. Text. Right, <laughs> and anyone is gonna, any of the Mafarshim is gonna have to do that. But the only question is like, if we did it, are we gonna have any basis? Or are we just right, like plugging yeah. stuff in? Yeah. yeah. All right. So let, let's let's do the first of the Mafarshim today, and then like raise some questions on on that Mafarish, and then uh, think about it for for Thursday. Okay. All right. So the first one we're doing is Ovadia mi Bartanura. All right. Uh, yeah. You know him from somewhere. No, I'm from, from the wine, yeah, yeah. Uh, just so you know your your people here, uh, Bartonura is obviously a place. Okay, it's in Italy. Ovadimi Bartonura was an early Acheron who commented on the Mishnah. Okay, and, and since Pirkei Alves is Mishnayos, he has a running commentary on the Mishnah, and he usually tries to do like you know very like uh, like Rashi style, where he's just explaining what the words are. Okay, and like a and a basic shot. Okay, uh, anyone want to try to read this? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Worthy is a good way to say it. I, I translated it as Zoha as to obtain merit. Um, because you'll you'll see you'll see the problem in a second. You'll see why it has to be like this. Okay. Yeah, who will merit on my behalf? That's why I didn't translate it as worthy, right? Because if I'm not worthy for myself, who will worthy me? Like it just doesn't fit as smoothly into that. You know, who will who will get merit for me on my behalf? Even if I merit for myself, yep. Mahu has What is this merit? Yeah. Uba men and how will I be? Yeah, but men nechshav is an idiom. Uh, anyone know what ba men is? What way? Uh, not what way. Like this is kind of related to the modern uses of, of like chashuv or chashivus. Like, what is it worth? What is its significance? Uh, what is it? Neged masha ani Corresponding to what I am worthy of. Chayev. Obligated. Obligated to do exactly. So well, I, I translate. What is its worth in relation to what I'm obligated to do? Okay, or or, or like compared to what I'm obligated to do? Okay. Oh. In Losha, and not and it's not now, but Olam Hazar in this Imati. Imasi. Oh, Imasi, yeah. Then what? The Ahar Hamavas is when after or when after I die. Yeah, I think because is, is good because after after death. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so Imasi is the Okay, so you want um let's not actually we're gonna set aside the Pierce Akhar right now. Uh we'll just focus on the source parish here. Okay. okay, so if I'm not for myself. Meaning, if I don't get my own merit, my own zechus, on my own behalf, so then who is going to get merit on my behalf? So what? What is that? What is his conclusion there? Or not his conclusion? Like what? What? No one else can get merit for you. Okay, that's his. That's like his first statement, right? And that's again, if you translate the rhetorical question to a statement, it's like like I have to get my own zechus because no one can get zechus for me. Okay. And then if I do get zechus, so then what is it even worth, right? And and what what's causing him to say that it's of little worth? I mean, it just sounds like a humble question. It is, but he's giving an argument though. Because you can't give someone else. No, he he says it he says it straight out. Oh, we just gotta... no, like compared to like what I need in order. Yeah, in other words, like there's so much that I'm obligated in. So let's say I get a little zchus here, like that's like a penny, and like I have to get like a whole ton, you know. So like it's it's very like it's not. I was right. It's like it's it's just like um a uh, uh what's the word? I'm looking. It's humble, but there's another word for it. Um, 
whatever. Yeah. Modest, modest, humble statement of like, like, what is it even worth? I've got so much that I have to do. You know, it's like, if you, if you make a, yeah, it's like, if you make a dollar, you know, okay, great job, man. You made a dollar. Like you got, you got to make a lot more than that to get by in this world. Um, and then if not now, this is the easiest point to understand. If not now in this world, then, uh, then when it's impossible to do after that. Right. So the only time I can do this is now. Okay. So that's shot. Okay. Um, any problems or questions on, on his interpretation? Yeah, I mean, it kind of seems obvious. Yes, that's the major problem here, okay? Duh, right? Like, obviously, no one else could do mitzvahs for you. That would be very easy. Just pay someone to do your mitzvahs for you, you know? You're the only one who could do mitzvahs for yourself, okay? And don't ask me about, like, when, when uh, you know, when um, someone makes kiddush for you, like, you know, because that's like Shomayaka One. Like, they're doing the mitzvah for you, but, you know, but you're, you're still participating, right? Um, and obviously, like, yeah, you have a lot to do, but zuchus is worth whatever it's worth. Yeah, don't degrade. Yeah, don't degrade it. Like, like it's a, you know, we say you should do every mitzvah because every mitzvah has zuchus, you know. Uh, and yeah, we know that if you don't, that the only place you can do mitzvahs is in this world, you know, because uh, you can't do it after death. So, like, this is an example of if this were directed at a general audience then you could say that these are the points he's teaching them, that like you can only do mitzvahs in this world, you can't do it after death. But I feel like since this is for Pirkei Avos, and this is something that Hillel used to say, I feel like it's something that like has to be of benefit even to the Hasid, because, you know, and so it can't be obvious. So like, what was he thinking? Like, why did he need to like even go through these things? You know, did he like look at himself in the mirror every day and say, okay, Hillel, no one's going to do mitzvahs for you. You got to do it yourself. Like, you know, what, what, what was he thinking? Right. Yeah, I think that's the main question. I want to point something else uh, as a side point, only because I was discussing with uh, with uh, Mayan, uh, had some questions that she wanted to, to discuss. And one of the questions was, um, the what's the deal about, this is a side point. Okay, so let's, maybe we'll talk about the side point for the rest of the day and think about the questions for next time. But side point is, what's the deal with like learning Torah or doing mitzvahs in someone's zuchus? I was also thinking about that. Yeah. Like, yeah. You yeah. could daven for someone else. Uh, you mean who's alive? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. So you could talk for someone else uh, when they're alive, but that's not doing the mitzvah for them. We have spoken about this before. Yeah, yeah. You're saying about like doing, like learning Torah in the slush with someone who's dead? Who's dead, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. The case of davening for someone else, do you mean like davening for someone who's sick, for example? And, yeah. Yeah, right. So there you're kind of davening for them as an object. I don't, I don't mean to like say object like, like that. Like, right. The whole like field work that we did help. Your yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, right. So they're they're being treated like like a, a recipient of the benefits of your tefillah or like the results of your tefillah. Yeah. You're not doing the mitzvah for them, you know. Uh, like you can't just like sit back in your pool like with the sunglasses on and like say daven for me, servant. You know, like um, uh, yeah. So but the question is like when someone died and people learn or do um, mitzvahs in their zchus, what does that mean? Okay, and, and we might have talked about this before in, in, in like a question and answer and like in passing. So I just want to make it clear. So there are people who clearly hold that you can do that. What's the body of Bartonur's position on that? Okay. Clearly you can't, okay, right? Is that, that the only person who could give you zuchus is you. And the only time you can get zuchus is in this world because after death, you can't, you can't get zuchus. And this is based on the Rambam's view of, um, of after the soul, Sorry, after the soul. After death, your soul cannot change. The only way you can change is when your soul is joined to a body. Then you can do mitzvahs and you can learn and get new knowledge and increase your level. But then after death, then the, your soul is fixed, so to speak, wherever it's at. Which is why, what's the uh, the which of the thirteen ikarim pertains? To, well, I guess that's a very general question. Say again. Yeah, yeah it's amazing. What's good about it's amazing? You get, then you can come back and do more mitzvahs and learn more Torah and increase your zuchus, right? So that's the premise there. I honestly don't know, people who hold that you can learn in someone else's zuchus after they're dead, I don't know what they make of this. You know, I'm sure they have explanations for it, uh, but I, 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 I don't, don't know what that is. And clearly they can't learn Hillel's statement like this. If not now, when? After death. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, if you, if you got all the time in the world, literally. You can't do it yourself. Yes. So you're going to be relying Right, wow. right. So I guess the real question would be then in in a mealy mealy. Yeah. That would be the question, right? Also, yeah. The fact that he's Hillel, like, it excuse me when coming to him. Um yes, yeah. I mean because awesome. yeah, he's he's a great great person. Yeah. Um another yeah, you're yeah, 
Uh, I, one question I, I think we should think about also is, is this talking about the Derech Ha'am or the Derech Ha'yachid? Right. What indications are there that it's talking about the Derech Ha'am? Yeah, obligation, right? Is 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 like Kenegan Mash Ani Chayav Lasos is I have to do lots and keep lots and lots of halakha or do lots of mitzvahs, and I've just done this, you know. Um, and and the it also clearly fits into the third clause. You can only do mitzvahs in this world, you know. And the first clause also, like if you say zechus means like doing a mitzvah, then like only you can do it. But then what what could you say that this is talking about the derech What 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 indications would there be, or how would you read it if it was talking about the derech yachid? in comparison to like going beyond the letter. Yeah, is that 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 uh what is it worth in relation to the infinite amount of, of perfection that I can get from every mitzvah? Like mm -hmm. in other words, if it's talking about picking up a lulav, I can do that. But if it's talking about getting all of the benefits and perfection of the objectives of Lulav, that's like an infinite journey. That I think makes a lot more sense for the second clause. And maybe you can say that Zhus is not doing the mitzvah. Zhus is the 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 merit you get from the mitzvah, like the perfection you get from doing the mitzvah itself. And there it's like, that puts it more into the realm of something Hillel might talk about, you know? So that's something to keep in mind. Ayala, you had a question? Well, I was just like saying, like, let's say you're saying you're learning in someone's book, so not that like you'll bump them up, yeah. but that like you'll somehow like spread their... Yeah, so that 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 works. Is that if you're saying that that like their worthiness is what is the impetus for me learning, or I want to spread, you know, memory of their good qualities. So then that's good. I just think for that that like the the easier term is is a uh, uh, is lezecher nishma so and so because that's the whole idea of the mishlei pasuk zecher tzadik livracha that when you remember a tzadik it leads to bracha because you remember how good they were and how inspiring they were and like that makes you uh, you do more. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're gonna have to do that to answer this. Uh, okay. Good. All right. So let's think about this for Thursday. And see you then. You're welcome. Uh, later, yeah. I got